Okay, Bonnie, it's over to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kat. I want to, first of all, thank HDO for inviting me to do this presentation and to all of you for taking the time. I really appreciate it. So I always like to start with a quote. Yesterday is history, tomorrow is a mystery, but today is a gift. That's why they call it the present. So my plan for you uh, today at this webinar is to provide information and education to you. And I want you to think about this information as a gift. So some of you are going to open this up and say, oh, it's just what I needed, and that's great. And some are going to say, what is this? I'm not sure I want this, and are going to pack it up and try to return it, and maybe just put it in the back of your closet for a while if you can't. And then some are going to say, well, you know, I'm not really sure I need this um, right now, but maybe one day, uh, you know, I will be able to use this. And so why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I do realize that not every family is the same. However, there are many similarities between families who deal with crisis and chronic illnesses. So by recognizing these similarities, I'm able to discuss the who, when, how, and what associated with talking to kids about HD. So the topics I'm going to go over today are understanding the reasons for talking to kids, knowing those who, when, how, and what, learning about kids' emotions, and learning approaches of sharing information. So families affected by HD definitely have an added stressor when children are involved, and many times the parents and caregivers I've spoke to feel the best way to protect children is to shield them from the knowledge that HD is in the family. And while it might feel at the beginning that this will meet the family's needs, to tell you the truth, unfortunately, it's detrimental to the family dynamics in the long run. Many of the adults in my practice state that HD was hidden from them and not discussed in their homes. So the reaction is really anger, which makes coping with HD that much more difficult. These people feel robbed. They feel like they can't trust. And they feel that the choices they've made about their own lives, even if, they were not, even if the, the choices were exactly the same, were made without having all the information right there in front of them. So a child has a right to know about anything that affects the family. By not talking about it, as I've said with my practice, children grow up to be adults and learn to not trust. And children know that something is wrong. By not saying anything, they might have fears worse than the real situation. For example, they might uh, imagine that they did something to cause a family member to become ill, which isn't true. And in turn, they can develop anxiety and guilt. And again, not talking about HD gives a message that it's a subject too terrible to discuss, and we don't want to give that information. Children also might find out the truth from someone else. Sooner or later, this happens. Children are learning more and more, especially in school, about genetics. So one example that I can give to you is a family that I worked with for a long time. I worked with the mom um, who at first really did not want to talk to her daughter about HD. We talked and we discussed this for many months, and she said, okay, I, I really feel that this is a good idea for me to do. So she said, I'm going to tell my daughter that we're going to have a girls' night out. We're going to go for dinner. We're going to go to, you know, to do different things. And while I'm at dinner with her, I'm going to tell her that, you know, her father has HD. Two days before that, that uh, outing, that girls' night out, the girl came to her mother and said, you know, I have biology in school, and it's kind of interesting because the teacher's talking about genetics. And she went on to explain genetics to her mother, and she said the teacher put up a whole bunch of illnesses that are, are genetic, and one of them is, is called Huntington's disease. And she described this. And I'm looking at dad, and I'm wondering, you know, is this what he has? So again, this is not the way that this mother wanted to give her daughter this information, but she took a deep breath and said, okay, I have the tools, I know how to do this. And she said, yes, you know, one of the things that I was going to tell you about at this girl's, at this, you know, girl's night out for us is, is about your dad. And, and I'm sorry that I didn't tell you earlier, but let's, let's do this and let's go, you know, to the, into the future knowing that I'm going to tell you as much as I know. And it was, it was okay. It just wasn't the way that the mom really wanted to. Um, and children who are informed can be a comfort to you. You don't have to feel that you must spend energy into remembering what you actually told them. And I'll talk a little bit about lying later on. Also know that children have an amazing ability and capacity to deal with difficult situations. We really have to remember that fears are learned. So even when a child, a baby, sees a spider or a snake or something, they're not afraid. They don't know to be afraid. And the same is, is true for emotions or dealing with what we consider difficult things. 
if you're able to deal with those things, a child is too. But if, a, if you show that this is awful and that this is something to be feared, that's what a child is going to learn. And remember, if the person with HD shows behaviors which now have an explanation, then children will learn that this is normal and continue to show affection and respect towards that person. So who should tell the kids? Certainly you, if you are the person with HD, if you are a the will uh, spouse, if you are a caregiver of this person, a guardian, if you can, you should tell the kids about HD. If you can't, for whatever reason, a close family can do this, but make sure that that person has the correct facts about HD, not just somebody that, you know, is going to sugarcoat this. And, and, I, and I don't mean to be, um, you know, uh, to, to consider this as really, a, you know, something that has to be a, a scary thing, but you really don't, you want somebody who's going to tell them the truth and the information. And I'll tell you how to do that as well. But again, remember that it could be a, a close family member with a child, a close family uh, person to the child, and also somebody who does have the correct facts. And then if those things are really difficult, professional staff can help you. The one caveat that I do have is that when there are young people, young children, who come into my office um, who don't know where they're going or who they're going to meet, it's very, very scary, especially for little kids who are going into a building, who are going to see somebody that they've never met, who's going to tell them something really important about their mom or dad or guardian, whoever it is in the family. So I do ask people, if they're going to bring children in, to give them at least, you know, those, those kind of few little words that we're going to go talk to one of the doctors um, who's helping dad or who's helping mom with, with something called Huntington's disease. So again, I'll tell you how to, to do all of that. Also, just know that there are a lot of professionals who will allow you to bring a child into a clinic and not really discuss this at first, but just kind of say, oh, I just wanted to meet you. A lot of times I get on the floor and do some coloring with a child, and then they know who I am. And then coming back the next time to say, oh, remember we met Dr. Bonnie? She's going to talk to us more about dad. So there's lots of different ways to be able to do this. So when should I tell my kids? People have made all kinds of arguments, ranging from they're too young, they won't understand, I don't want to ruin his or her childhood, they're studying for exams, they just met someone, she's engaged, he's getting married, uh, she's pregnant now. It, you know, it really runs the gamut of all, any and all ages. Uh, but also, you know, do know that the younger the child uh, is, the more basic the information should be. And certainly adolescence is going to be a time for more specific questions. I'm actually not going to get into too many of the ages and stages in this webinar. We do have some resources that you can look up some information or, or, or purchase some information. So my message to you in terms of when you should tell the kids is it's never too early. Again, you know, I'll give you specific ways to do that, but also know that it's never too late. And by that, sometimes I have people who come up to me after webinar, uh, who talk to me after webinars or come up to me at conferences and say, I did it wrong. I, you know, we knew for a long time and, and I just, I didn't do it wrong. And the feedback that I give to people is, you didn't do it wrong. You did the best job you could at that time with the information you had. But now you have a jumping off point. Now you can say to your child, however old they are, you know what, I just heard a webinar or I just went to a conference, whatever it is, and say, you know what, I really need to make sure that you have this information. I want to do this the best way I can now. So there's always a chance that you can go ahead and have these conversations with young people. So, how should I tell my kids? Certainly, you need to look at your own feelings about HD. Your own feelings are going to be based on your own experiences. Someone who has an opus on, open, honest family relationship is certainly going to present HD different than a person from a family where there's been a lot of denial that they haven't discussed this. So no matter what, feelings of anger need to be worked through prior to discussions with children. I really strongly encourage people to talk to somebody, to talk to a therapist, to talk to somebody in an HD center to say, I really need to work this through. Because as much as you really want to, you know, talk about this to your children, you really want to make sure that you are, uh, have, have really resolved some of your own issues. And try to find a language that's comfortable to you to talk about this. So one example is of a, a, a family that I spoke to with a very small child, and they said that daddy had a boo-boo in his head. Okay, so, you know, great that they spoke to this child, but the one thing is that there's other people that this child is going to have contact with 
who use that term boo-boo. So maybe this child is out at a playground someplace and skins their knee and an adult says, oh, you have a boo-boo on your leg. So again, the child's going to be like, wait a second, daddy has a boo-boo and I have a boo-boo. Are those the same? So again, you know, you can certainly say something like, you know, daddy has a boo-boo, but this is a special one that's called HD. You can't catch it. You can't, you know, not, you can't do anything that's um, like falling down or hurting yourself that's going to cause this to happen to you. It's really specific. So that's really, a, you know, a good tip that you just sort of think it through when you are choosing your words. And definitely, the, you know, you do need to talk to different age children separately. And by that, I mean you're going to speak to a six-year-old a lot different than you're going to talk to a 16-year-old. But again, I have a caveat with this. It's really important that you tell all your children at the same time and they see that this is something that's being told. So many times I talk to people who say, I've told one child, but you know what, for whatever reason, because of the age, because of uh, emotional issues or developmental issues, they haven't told the other child or other children. And I really ask people to think about that because it really is a burden for that child that's being told. Uh, it's, it can be very different when you say, don't tell your siblings about this. So again, you know, fears are learned and this is something that's going to be there that children pick up on anyway. So I do suggest that children are given the basic information and all together saying, you know, that there's something going on here. Daddy or mom has Huntington's disease and then speaking to different uh, age children separately. And role play. Practice what you say and anticipate those tough questions. And I'll tell you what those questions are. You know, am I going to get this? Is daddy, mommy going to die? Are you going to die if you're the well parent? Am, you know, am I going to get this? Am I going to die? These are hard questions, but you really have to think through about what you're going to say. And again, I'll give you some information of how you might be able to do that. But just know that that's really important. And also, I'm going to talk about this later, when you do role play and you do answer questions, you always want to leave um, a conversation with a lot of hope. And I'll tell you about that in a little bit. And find a, a comfortable or familiar place to talk to kids. Maybe you're that kind of family that as you're cleaning up the kitchen or taking a walk or playing a board game, that that's your place that you start talking to uh, your family about important things. One uh, example I can give to you is not so much a family talking about HD, but something that was really important. I had a woman who had, at the time, uh, pre-adolescent boys, two boys, and she already told them about Huntington's disease in the family and that she, they knew that she had Huntington's disease. But what she said to me is she knows that the boys are going to be getting older and that her disease is going to progress, but she really wanted to talk to these boys about her values in terms of of relationships and sex and really difficult things that might be in the future. But she said, I don't know if I'm going to have a voice then to do that. So she said, you know, we talked about it a little bit. And she said, we have our conversations at the dinner table. But I sit across from my husband and the two boys sit on the either side. And they, you know, are going to kind of you know, roll their eyes and, and, and go underneath the table if I start talking about sex at the dinner table. And she said, I'm just not going to be really comfortable. So we talked about where she's alone with the boys. And at the time, and this is many years ago, she was the one who's driving them around. And she said, oh, you know, I, I drive them to the mall once in a while. And I said, perfect. Um, this is about 20 minutes. You're getting in the car. The boys are in the back seat. You don't have to look in their eyes. They don't have to look in yours. You lock the doors. And for 20 minutes, the forum is yours. You open up and just talk to them. And she did this. And she said, you know, I wasn't going to get into the nitty gritty details. But I wanted to let them know that if there was a time that I wasn't able to have this conversation, that I just wanted to know, I wanted them to know how I felt and what was important to me. And it, and it really turned out well. So what and how much should you tell your kids? So these are the different topics now I'm going to go over. Talking, uh, telling children information they can understand, listening to them, telling them how you feel, and be, wearing, be aware of the don'ts and some ways to talk to kids. So how should you tell information? If you remember, if you've been around babies, that when they move from um, milk, you know, formula, breast milk, whatever it is, to, uh, to food, you, you don't, obviously, and I'm being kind of funny about this, you're not going to put a steak in front of a child. But I want you to think of that analogy, that you really are going to take a tiny bit of this mush that, you know, is unfamiliar to the child and just give them a tiny bit on a spoon to see if they're going to be able to take it in, ingest it, and, and, and swallow, you know, what, what's on the spoon. That's how I 
want you to think about this. So many times I talk to caregivers and parents who just sit down with their kids and all of a sudden it's just, they start spewing all this information. You really have to just give tiny bits of information. And it's not going to be a one-time deal. It truly is like feeding a child. You need to continue to do that over and over. And again, as I said to you, I would go back to this, leave them with a feeling of hope. I do this with children and adults and anyone who I talk to in my, in my therapy uh, uh, um, consultation service or when I'm giving a lecture or when I'm answering questions, I really leave people with a feeling of hope. That's really important to me. Now more than ever, there is so much incredible research that's coming down the pike right around the corner, and the hope is that the scientists and doctors and everybody working on finding a treatment for Huntington's disease is really getting close. So I think that that's really important for us all to know, that there's tons of hope coming. And do tell children and adults that they're always going to be loved and cared for. That's really important to them. So listen to them. Answer questions simply. Sometimes we get a question from somebody and it is, you know, all of a sudden you are answering all kinds of things that you think are important. And it's not necessarily that way. So you really want to just answer questions simply. Ask them, tell me what you think HD is. I do this in my clinic with, um, in my practice with adults as well as children. When I'm meeting somebody for the first time and it's about Huntington's disease, even if they grew up with it, even if it's multi-generation, I say to them, so tell me, if you were speaking to somebody on the street who didn't know anything about Huntington's disease, what would you tell them? That way I can go back and correct things that aren't true right from the beginning. Even if they say, oh, I know, I've, I've lived with somebody, that's great. But there still could be misinformation that needs to be corrected. And ask the children, ask your kids if they're worried about you or the family member. Chances are they might say no because, again, they're trying to protect you. But a really good way of being able to, to do this is say, well, I'm glad to hear that you weren't worried. But just so you know, I was worried when I heard about HD. And if you're ever worried, I know, please know that you can come to me. We can't change the fact that we're worried, but we can be in it together. That way, again, their communication is open. And also look for those nonverbal cues to see if a child has had enough. There's like that invisible on-off switch that you know that their eyes are glazed over and they're really not paying attention. That's sort of your cue to say, okay, I need to pull back a little bit and just say, we're going to continue. Stop, but tell them you plan to just continue the discussion another time. So here we go. Be aware of the don'ts. Here's my don't lie. Lying takes so much energy. You have to think about what you've said and keep everything, you know, kind of in this separate folder in your head that says, you know, what did I tell them? What, what was said? What was, what, what appointments were made? What medication is around? It takes so much energy. So please don't lie. And don't overburden children with a lot of medical detail. So again, if people ask me questions, I, am, I listen to the question, I try to formulate an answer, and then I say, did that answer your question? Because I might be totally on the mark and they say, yep, this is great, or they might be asking me something totally different that I had a different perception in my head. So this is a really good way of, of making that clear. And don't trouble children with financial concerns that lets it impacts them directly. So like a lifestyle change. I had a family that was really, you know, doing really well and was able to take three, you know, big vacations a year. And with some of the financial changes that happened, that wasn't the case. So they said, listen, we're going to do smaller vacations and we're still going to do our one big vacation, but we really need to think about how this is going to impact us and just, you know, we need to be a little more careful. Please don't make promises you can't keep. That's um, that. This is a hard one because I do have so many families that say to their children, I promise you're not going to get HD. And for some people, we know that that's true. If they've gone through PGD, you know, anything that they know that this child is um, not going to have the gene for Huntington's disease, okay. But if you say to a child, I promise you're not going to get this, and you don't really know, there's some of that trust issue. Also, sometimes I have people who make promises to say, I promise I will keep mom or dad in the house, um, you know, um, and, and will take care of them forever. That's a hard one as well, because you don't know how they're going to be in the future. You don't even know how you as a will person is going to be. And, you know, and this is just something that would be really a lot of resentment later on. What you can say is, you know what, that's my hope as well. But we're going to have to really work together. We're going to have to figure out what the future holds. Hopefully, we'll all be healthy and continue to do this. But I can't make that promise right now. Also, don't be afraid to say, I don't know. I don't know means two things. 
I don't know means I don't know, and maybe we can talk to somebody who does. But also, I don't know means, you know what, I don't know, and no one's going to know until the future. So we're going to have to just kind of sit with this for a while. And it's okay to say that. I don't know is not a cop-out. Also, don't push kids to talk. I mean, you want to be able to find those opportunities, but you really don't want to keep pushing them and pushing them. So one thing in terms of having this discussion is to be able to say to a child, I gave you a lot of information today. I know your friends can be a support for you, but not a lot of people know about HD. So if you have questions, I can put you in touch with HD experts. So let's go into ways of saying things. It can be really simple in sentences. Mom, daddy has illness as an illness, and it's called Huntington's disease, or HD for short. This illness makes mommy or daddy do some things that aren't always normal. You can also draw a family tree or talk to kids about the family member with Huntington's disease. That way you don't have to go and to jump into the at-risk status right away, but the children will be able to understand that there are other people in the family with Huntington's disease. Coping with unknowns and uncertainties. There are so many unknowns and uncertainties in dealing with HD. There are some questions that you're not going to be able to answer, and if you accept this, you're going to be able to have your children accept this fact also. But you also want to find out as much as you can to make things more familiar. And remember that, to, to tell you the truth, there's some children who might be relieved to hear the facts about HD. And I know that might sound a little strange, but I had one uh, family member who, uh, there was a, a girl in the family who um, everybody in the family who was female, you know, happened to have HD, even though we know it's 50. Her mother, uh, her mother's sister, which would be her aunt, her grandmother, um, there were a couple of other females in the family, and that's all she saw, that she, she knew that there was something called HD, but, you know, people really didn't give her a lot of information. They just said, this is what's happening. And she made this assumption. She was like, okay, I grow up and I have HD. And she had a brother, and she's like, okay, he's going to be fine. And when she heard about what was going on, she's like, wait a second. I have the same 50-50 chance that my brother does, and there's a chance that we both will not have this gene, that don't have this gene. And she, you know, again, felt a little bit more, let her, that the family let her in, that they felt she felt included, and she, understood, she began to understand why changes were happening in the family. So that was one example for that. So some of the tips to deal with change. Let children know gradually that there is changes in what the person with HD is able to do. So, for example, driving. Um, you know, when someone gets tested and they're still working and are still quite capable of doing a lot of things, you're not going to tell a child, oh, you know, dad's not going to be able to drive. I mean, that, that could be years and years down the road. But the opposite, and to make this point really clear, the opposite is I've had families where they get up one day to get ready for school, and there's dad, you know, in his jammies, and they're like, well, what's going on? Why is dad not getting ready for, for work? And all of a sudden, it's like, well, dad doesn't go to work anymore. It's like, well, when did that happen? And, you know, what was going on? So there's certainly a gradual period where someone says, you know what, I think work is getting harder for me, so I'm going to tell my boss you nor know, human resources I'm not going to be able to work. That's the time to tell the child that this is going to look different at home. So that's really important that the, the changes are known gradually. And you want to try to keep household routines as normal as possible without denying an illness. So by this, I mean that you really want to make sure that if a person with HD is really having difficulty driving, whether their license has been revoked or not, you really don't want to put children in a car with somebody who is having difficulties. So you don't want to say, oh, we're not going to talk about this, or we're going to deny HD, and we're just going to allow these children or anybody else to, to be in a car. Um, you know, especially with that person with HD who could be at risk to other people who are driving around with their children. So you, you want to try to keep routines in the household as normal as possible. So it might be in that situation where dad stays home that he can help to get the lunches ready. Or if that's too stressful for him in the morning, that when everyone leaves, he starts putting away a few things and he gets a small list of things that he needs to do in the house. Because the child doesn't want to come home at 3 o'clock and see, you know, mom or dad on, on the sofa in their pajamas, you know, eating potato chips. Uh, it, it's just, it's not going to be helpful. And also the next one is to ask for help. It's so, so difficult to do this, but it really does take a village to be able to make sure that people who are dealing with HD are okay. And I think that it's really one of those things that is so hard to ask for help. I have so many families that I've worked with who have been really reluctant to do that. 
One family many years ago that I worked with did not want to talk about HD at all. They had two children who were very involved with sports. The, the kids played soccer. And they didn't really want to talk to their kids. They didn't want to, certainly didn't want to talk to anybody else, employers, uh, friends, even close friends. And they became isolated. And the kids really knew that there was a problem but didn't know what was going on. Um, the mom had to work part-time because the dad had Huntington's disease and wasn't able to work anymore. She wasn't able to drive them to all their practices. They they couldn't get there. They were benched for certain games. They they um, uh, quit, you know, some of their their sports. And unfortunately, those kids got involved with some um, some other young people who were not making good decisions for themselves. They got into some drugs and alcohol, and they didn't have an outlet. They didn't know what was going on. So after a very long time, this went went from the from this family not telling anyone to basically, I went to a town and did a town hall meeting for the entire town that they lived in to say, this is what's going on with this family. We need we need help. And the family, the outpouring was incredible. Um, they said, you know, we're going to help to, to, in terms of shopping for you. We're going to help keep uh, on, uh, tabs on the kids when you're away. We're going to help out, you know, getting them back into into um, their sports. And I would love to be able to tell you that everything was like, you know, butterflies and rainbows afterwards. And that's not what happened right away. You know, it was difficult at first. Um, it wasn't always gradually into like everything is great now, but it, it made a huge difference and the family was okay in the long run. It took a lot of work to try to get everyone back on track, but it did work and it was really, um, this family was so, so grateful. But also the people in the town were thankful that they could do something for this family. They felt good knowing that there were things that they could do. Also in terms of dealing with change, you want to be flexible when necessary. I had a family that um, the, fa the, the father spoke to their, his children openly and upfront with them about everything. Um, the mom had Huntington's disease. There was one night that they were going to do what we called movie night, that they, each child, there were two children, were able to take a child, a friend, to a movie. And mom was going to come. They, you know, they had it all set up with the movie and everything. And certainly at last minute, mom, just because, probably because it was something different and she was a little anxious, she, she started acting out. And the father was able to sit down with the children and the friends to say, okay, we know what this is about. We're not mad at mom. This is about her Huntington's disease. We're not going to say she ruined anything because this is about her HD. We're going to label this as we don't like HD. But mom might be a little scared to go or might feel anxious, and she starts acting out. So they were able to send mom to her room, and she, you know, she was able to, to stay there. The father said, okay, we're going to make some popcorn. We're going to, you know, set up Netflix, and we're going to have a couple of movies here, and another night we're going to go out. But it really was helpful so that nobody was labeling mom as the problem. It was about HD, and everyone understood. You also want to be flexible when necessary. It is always good to have a backup program. So in this situation, another situation I was dealing with, I had a family who um, got an invitation to a big event that was happening. They were all excited, including the, the father who had Huntington's disease. Um, so I'm going to call him Joe. And Joe um, did have some behavioral issues, but when the family was invited, he was really excited. And I spoke to the, the, the wife, and she was like, this is going to be great. And I said, okay, but let's have a plan B. And she said, no, 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 Joe was really excited. I said, you know what, let's just just have a plan B in, 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 the, uh, in the back pocket. So she said, okay, I, I know where you're going with this. I think you're right. So she called a friend, Charlie, and said, at the 11th hour, you know, are you going to be available this weekend? I mean, we're away for two days. We're going to plan to have, have Joe go, but he might not be ready. He might, you know, also have some behavioral issues going on. And sure enough, that day, Charlie said yes, and that day came by. And, you know, again, it, it's not so much that, that Joe wanted to ruin this for the family, but he was scared. He didn't know what to expect, and he didn't want to see all these people. Even though it was a fun thing, this was something that was, that was proving to be very anxious for him. He was very anxious. So, you know, basically, Joe had a meltdown and just said, nobody's going, and, you know, I'm not going. And they said, you know what, you have a choice. You can come with us 
or you don't have to, but we're going to go. And he's, no, 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 I can't be left alone. Someone has to take care of me. And the wife said, yeah, Charlie's coming over. And boy, you know, Joe was really, really angry. But you know what? He was angry anyway at this situation. Charlie came over and said, yep, I got this. I have the list of medications. I have the list of all the contact people. I have a list of the healthcare providers. I know what to do. And you know what? Joe settled down. He wasn't happy, but he settled down, especially in front of Charlie, who wasn't a stranger, but wasn't a close family family person um, was able to settle down and this family left and went to the event. Uh, again, I'm not going to say everything was, was all great because they were sad. They were sad that Joe was not with them, but they were able to enjoy themselves as well and know that, that Joe was going to be home and was going to be well cared for. So you definitely want to be flexible and have an emergency plan. So a lot of times when Huntington's is in the family, kids have a lot of feelings and reactions. And, and, and I want to be a little bit transparent in terms of this and, you know, in terms of uh, doing webinars. It's hard to sit in front of a screen for a long time like this listening to somebody talk. So I did take out um, issues in terms of ages and stages. And in, the, in my book, um, which I will put up the information in a couple of slides at the end, um, I do have the ways to get a hold of my book, Talking to Kids About HD. But I took out a specific ages and stages just so we can kind of uh, have time for some questions and answers as well. But when I talked about these different kids and, and how at different ages this all affects them, then I talk about kids' feelings and reactions, which I think is really important for you to know. So we have kids who feel sorry for themselves. Why is this happening to me? It's very narcissistic, but sometimes that's, that's what happens. Some kids might feel angry at the affected person for being sick. Some kids might feel angry at the disease, but then take it out on the well parent. Some kids might try to become that super kid and set unrealistically high goals for themselves. Some kids might feel scared and be fearful that there's something that will happen to the sick person when they're not there. Some kids might withdraw in order to become independent in case something happens to their parent. I'm going to be the man of the house, you know, when they're six or seven years old. Um, some kids might resent the fact that they need to take care of an affected person. Some kids might make jokes about everything to cover up their real feelings about HD. And some kids will act out in order to get attention or might say that they feel ill in order to stay with the affected person. Again, here's another caveat coming in. Kids get sick. We all know that. I'm talking, when I say they feel ill, these are the chronic headaches, the chronic stomach aches. I don't feel good. I don't want to go to school. I don't feel good. I don't feel good. And there's really nothing that you can see that's wrong. So what do you do in this situation? It's very important to continue to set firm limits with children. It is really vital that you continue to discipline children. It's normal to see some acting out when there are changes in a family. Communicate with your children you love them and you accept them, but not their misbehavior. You also want to reward good behavior and let them know how much you appreciate their help. And also you want to set limits with the internet. We all have been there. We all look up YouTube and Google Huntington's disease. There are some scary things out there. You really want to be able to set limits. So my suggestion, whether you're a healthcare professional or a parent or guardian, is log on to some really good websites. One great one, as we know, is HDO. So if you get on to HDO with them, not just say, oh, hey, have you heard of HDO? Go on. Go on after this webinar. If you haven't, go on to HDO.org and just Start, start clicking around. There's some incredible things out there. And it means so much for a young person to say, oh, my gosh, I'm connecting with somebody who's across the globe, and they know what it feels like to live with somebody who has Huntington's disease. So this is really important to do. And you want to share. You try to do things together as a family. Laugh together. Laughter is the best medicine. I have one family that makes up inspirational slogans and posts it around their house. The person with HD has one that says, I have a lot of living left to do, so that she knows you know, there is so much of a future that she still has, especially with her family. And share stories and uplifting experiences. So remember, when you create positive memories, you're teaching your children something. You're teaching them that it's okay to have fun, even in the midst of sadness. That's why you should go out. That's why you need to have that respite. And it's okay. It's kind of like when you hear on an airplane, you have to put your own mask on before you help other people in case of an emergency. You need to do that. You need to say, you know what, I need to rejuvenate my battery as well. And you teach your children to do that as well. 
please know that there is a silver lining. And I know it's difficult to see this, but children can really grow in their ability to face difficult experiences when they grow up in a family with HD. Granted, if I could wave a magic wand, I would make HD totally disappear. But because it's here, there is that silver lining for children. These children might become more self-confident and independent. They, I've seen time and time over the two decades I've been working with families with HD, children become more responsible. They become sensitive to others' needs, and they may grow in their ability to understand and love another person, even if that person is different. So, and here are some resources. Certainly, you can go on and just Google talking to kids about HD. Very easy to remember, all one word, and um, that information will come up. HDO is great. There's, it's a wonderful website written for young people by young people. And then also there's other Huntington's disease advocacy groups such as HDSA that um, you can go on. There's a publication list about talking to kids. The National Youth Alliance is part of that. And if you're in Canada, there's YPAD. Um, so that's, again, their national, their um, youth uh, association part of the Huntington's uh, Society of Canada. And there's lots throughout the globe, but you know these are just kind of a, a place to start for some people. So at the very end, I do like to uh, end with a quote as well. And this is about empowerment. The more we're, we feel at home with our fears, the easier it is to accept the reality of what is or what will be. And that's our own Marjorie Guthrie. So hopefully um, this information was helpful to you. This isn't rocket scientists. Rocket science, I tell people, you know these things. You know what to do. Sometimes you just need a little bit of a push to say, this is okay to do. And when I go to the camps, the, the HDO camps, and when I've talked to young people all over the globe, they do say, please talk to us. Let us in. It's going to be better for us if you do that versus not talking to us and not telling us things. Maybe times that we don't want to hear certain things, but we do want to gain that knowledge because knowledge is power for all of us. So I hope that you all felt that this was, was helpful. And I'm going to turn it back to Kat, and if there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much, Bonnie, for that. I'm just going to give you some little pieces of information on our future webinars and just also what I should have done at the start is just tell you a bit about us. So um, <clears throat> HDO was set up in 2012 and it was established by um, two young people. One of them is on this uh, presentation and he's hiding in the background. But Matt Ellison and BJ Vue are the co-founders of HDO. Um, we're a youth organisation that supports um, education for young people up to the age of 35 who are impacted by Huntington's disease. And our, globe, our goal <coughs> excuse me, is about providing support and education, but doing it in age and stage appropriate ways. Um, our main platform is the hdo.org website, but we also have a youth service in the US and we support youth services around the world as well. The international camps that Bonnie briefly mentioned at the end as well is, is one of our engagement tools for young people. Um, and we also offer support via the support section of the website uh, to anybody um, who needs it. Uh, just briefly about what we mean by young people, we have three uh, definitions. Anybody under the age of 13 comes under our kids section on the website. Our teen section is 14 to 17 year olds and our young adult section is 18 to 35 year olds. There's also a section dedicated to parents, a section dedicated to professionals and a section dedicated to GHD. When we talk about being impacted, it's anybody that HD touches. It doesn't need to be someone at risk or someone who is a caregiver. It is anybody who is touched by HD. Um, our future topics, we are always looking for um, new ideas. So please, if you have any ideas that you would like to hear a webinar about, then just get in touch with us um, and we will find the experts to be able to deliver it, like our Bonnie here. Um, but some of the ones that we have prepared over the next 12 months will be on testing relationships and we're talking about a series of relationships there, relationships within a family, um, loving relationships um, and uh, new partner relationships, friendships as well. Um, caring for a parent or family member, 
having children, grief and loss, taking part in research, understanding the impact on children and young people, and probably the most important one for anybody who's a carer is self-care. So we'll be running these over the next 12 months. Um, so please keep in touch. And if you are not subscribed to the newsletter um, or our social media channels, then please sign up because this is where you will find out what's going on when. Um, this is just our website. I just thought I'd better put it up and let you see it. Um, it's available in 14 languages. As I said, it's uh, personalised to each um, different age group and also theme. Um, and it's everything on the website is an open source licence, which means you are welcome to download it, share it, use it in any way that you want. Um, we would ask that you would just acknowledge that it came from us, but it is open source and you're able to use it wherever you would like. Quick disclaimer, um, HDO doesn't provide medical advice. Please always consult a medical professional for anything specific to do with HD that's medical. If you do not have access to a medical professional, please get in touch with support at hdo.org uh, um, and we will find one in your area who will be uh, happy to help you out there. And thank you very much to everyone who's joined us today. Um, we will get this recording uploaded to the website um, in, over the next couple of days. Um, and if anybody would like a copy of the recording, just send us an email and we will be happy to do that. Uh, our contact information is on this slide, but it is also on the website. So if there's anything specific, please get in touch. Um, last but not least, if anybody got any questions, then you can unmute yourself and ask them or you can send it in the chat function. Okay, we have no questions coming in, so thank you everybody. It has been our pleasure in hosting this webinar and I look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you. Good night everybody. Bye.